So today's guest speaker, Lauren Piercy, has been servicing the industrial food sector in Nova Scotia for 30 plus years and has occupied the position of account manager for Santamark uh, Food and Beverage for the past 11 years. Lauren has held various roles in his career, account manager, regional sales management, and director of training development. His experience and expertise cover sanitation, chemistry, training, and training development, site auditing, and contamination investigations. Lauren holds a certificate in adult education development and an advanced certificate in adult learning and teaching. Lauren is presently working on a certificate in equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. That's also at Dalhousie University. So we will have time for questions at the, at the end um, and everyone will remain muted. And if you can just submit the questions at the Q&A at the very bottom of your screen, um, that would be great. And now I will hand it over to you, Lauren. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for that introduction, Pam. And um, thank you to, per to Prania for hosting this webinar and the opportunity to, to host this webinar. And to everyone who has made the time to participate today, thank you. Uh, uh, the, today's topic is biofilms in the food processing environment, what you need to know and do. And in this um, presentation, what we're going to do is going to take about 35 to 45 minutes, or it could be a little less. Uh, all questions can be posted, as Pam said, on the, on the question uh, uh, box below in writing. And we will have time to answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation is recorded and I think will be available for later review. Let's talk about who Sanimark is. Uh, Sanimark is a company that has been in existence now for well over 40 years. Uh, we are the largest company of our kind in Canada. And we have um, uh, a presence from coast to coast. Uh, we have three divisions, a pool and spa division, a food and beverage division, and a janitorial division. I work for the food and, food and beverage division. And our expertise is in the, in the sanitation uh, products and sanitation procedures and training and support for the entire industrial food sector. So that would include red meat, poultry, fish, produce, dairy, anything where food is, is uh, manufactured and processed on an industrial scale, scale, that's our field of expertise. So um, in, in 2010, Sandy Mark uh, developed and started their biofilm research program. Uh, we went into partnership with the Montana State University Center for Biofilm Engineering, uh, which is one of the leading uh, campuses, leading uh, departments for biofilm research on the planet, actually. Uh, we made a significant investment and are continuing to make a significant investment in the development of uh, the understanding of biofilms in the food industry and uh, to the development of a unique theoretical and a practical and regulatory expertise on biofilm within our organization. This allows us to be able to be a resource for our customer base and a resource for the industry when dealing with this particular issue. So today's presentation, we're going to cover what a biofilm is, take the mystery out of that. Everyone's probably heard about it, but no one really understands it. So we're gonna talk about what exactly is a biofilm. Uh, we will talk about the conditions required for a biofilm development, a biofilm to, to establish itself and develop within a food processing facility, what's required for that and how it can happen. We'll also have a discussion on why biofilms are an issue for the food processing industry. Uh, it's important to know that. Again, people have an understanding that it's not a good thing, but don't really understand why it's not a good thing. So we'll bring some clarity to that. And we'll uh, also uh, talk about how to identify biofilms in your processing facility. Uh, we'll talk about some effective strategies to remove and control biofilms as part of your sanitation program, because that's where it has to be plugged into is into your sanitation program. And we'll talk about the chemistries and the tools required for biofilm removal. And the support mechanisms available to you as a customer, to you as a producer, 
uh, that you can help address this particular issue and, and move forward in a positive manner. So let's talk about the first topic. What is a biofilm? Pure biofilms do not exist in the environment. A biofilm consists are composed of many things, of many microorganisms. There's a bacteria, there's yeast mold and other fungi within a biofilm. Uh, there are viruses, there are microscopic algae. So all of those things make up what a make up a biofilm. It's a, it's a very uh, complex uh, mix soup of microorganisms. Uh, biofilms are made up of the following components. There's most of the biofilm is water. 96 to 98, 99% of a biofilm is H2O. Uh, the uh, one to two percent of the biofilm are the microbial agents, the microbes that are in there. So it's it's a complex mixture of many different microorganisms working together. Uh, Pseudomonas, Listeria, Streptococci, coliforms. The composition of those various microbes could depend on many factors uh, that are uh, unique to the environment where the biofilm has been developed, has developed itself. And then there's the slime, which gives the name biofilm, that slimy matrix. That slime is a, is a, is a mixture, it's a polysaccharide uh, complex, complex that's made up of nucleic acids and glycoproteins. And it forms an extracellular or an exopolymer matrix around the bacteria colony and does what it does best. It protects the bacteria colony from outside negative forces. That's what it does. Now, just to come back to the second point here of one to 2% microbes. So some people may look at that and say, well, okay, so we have 98% water and only one to 2% microbes. Yeah, you do. But that one to 2% microbes represent tens to hundreds of millions counts of, of microorganisms. So even though it says one to 2%, it represents a huge number of the presence of microorganisms. Uh, just some, you know, biofilms is a naturally occurring thing in nature. It exists in many places. You know, the slime on rocks and, and, and piers, but we all are familiar in Nova Scotia with the slippery slimy rocks of Peggy's Cove. That's a biofilm. This here is a biofilm as well, the teeth, the woody mouth in the morning. Uh, tartar is also can be a biofilm, but usually when you have that woody mouth in the morning, that's a naturally occurring biofilm that's been established in your, in your mouth as you slept. So biofilms take on many, many forms. We've all had experiences with biofilms. The conditions required for biofilms are a surface, any surface will support a biofilm. Uh, it could be glass, it could be stainless, it could be plastic, rubber, concrete, any, any surface uh, with the right conditions can support a biofilm. The other thing you need is moisture or water, H2O. You need H2O in order for a biofilm to, to exist. And you need a nutrient. Now, in a food production environment, you have surfaces, you have water, and you have nutrients. So biofilms love food processing facilities. That's where they love to establish themselves. Uh, conditions required for a biofilm development. Basically what happens is you have a surface uh, and you have some free floating bacteria that will land on the surface. Within a short period of time, those bacteria will clump together and attach themselves to the surface. Uh, those bacteria cells will grow and divide and then start to form the biofilm to protect that established and growing colony. Then a mature biofilm forms, which has a, uh, a, a huge colony of microorganisms within that biofilm that are working together. And it will grow to the point where it'll be, it will become so crowded that the portion of the biofilm will release or rupture releasing more microorganisms from that rupture, which will then land on another surface and the process continues. That's basically how a biofilm forms. The timeline that that happens, but from step one to step five can be as, can, depending on the conditions, depending on the amount of nutrition, depending on the temperature, et cetera, et cetera, it can be as little as 24 hours or as much as 72. Either way, it's a short period of time for a biofilm to, to become established within a facility or on your equipment or in your, in your, um, on your production line. 
Why are biofilms an issue for the food production? Well, they, are, they present a number of problems in the food production industry. Um, biofilms themselves protect the microbes from many things. They protect microbes from detergents. Uh, they protect them from disinfectants and sanitizers, uh, preservatives. Uh, they protect them from antimicrobials. They protect the bacteria from biocides, heat, and radiation. You have to understand that a biofilm, the matrix of a biofilm, has evolved over millions and millions of years to do what it does best, to protect the bacteria colony. So it's a very tenacious and difficult thing to deal with, a biofilm. Uh, microbes in biofilms may be up to 3,000 times more resistant to the hypochlorous acid than free cells. Now, hypochlorous acid are the primary disinfection agents within the chlorine solutions that we use day to day. So we have a huge resistant factor of a, of a, of a, three, of a times of 3,000 towards normal cleaning agents and normal disinfectants and sanitizers if we have an established biofilm. Um, so why are biofilms uh, an issue for the food production? They're a continuous source of cross-contamination. So biofilms can be can present themselves uh, in a very frustrating way for uh, the QA, the QA department. Uh, if you're doing um, uh, uh, swabbing as part of your uh, as part of your validation process, you may get a pass on your swabs throughout the week, and then all of a sudden get a spike, and then all of a sudden it goes away. So they can be a continuous source of cross contamination as they release. Uh, they can also be a um, unfortunately can have been and can be the cause of foodborne illnesses depending upon what kind of microbes are within that matrix and if some of those microbes are pathogenic then of course foodborne illnesses can result from that if they contaminate your produced food and uh, of course that which would lead to the dreaded recall and and the dreaded uh, illness of, of people so we want to avoid that so this is why uh, biofilms can be a very very um, uh, big issue for the food production uh, uh, industry. So biofilms and food production will form anywhere where conditions of time, temperature, nutrients, and water allow, where poor hygienic design, damage, or wear and tear make routine cleaning difficult or ineffective. So things like poor design of, of the structure of your facility, poor design of the equipment used to produce your, your food, uh, poor design of transition, of staff, poor design of, of uh, anything that presents a, a hard reach area or an area that can be difficult to address in a cleaning standpoint can present itself uh, as, a, as a place for a biofilm to form. Uh, common hotspots are for biofilm uh, formation are complex food processing equipment. Equipment is becoming more and more complex as we try to automate. And it's, it's presenting a, a, an increased difficulty in being able to clean and sanitize those, those pieces of equipment. Things like leaky, leaky roof cavities on damp ceilings, backs and undersides of surfaces and drains and pipework. Now, the drain is circled here and we have a picture of a drain. It's not, the question is not, do you have biofilm in your drain? The question is, how much biofilm do you have in your drain? If you have a drain in your facility, you have biofilm in that drain. Uh, it's a matter of knowing how to address it and how to control it. So biofilms are absolutely perfect for uh, establishing and growing biofilms. And that's why in new builds or in any, any build of a food production facility, the, the drain design, how it flows, where it flows, is, is very crucial to, it, to establishing a safe production environment. Uh, biofilms and pathogens in drains. Uh, this was a, 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 a study done by Campton uh, BRI uh, for the British government, and they did a survey of cooked product areas for Listeria monos monocetaceans, and uh, the production environment, the uh, presence was very low. Uh, on floors, they had a 17% positive. Drains were quite high at 25%. And uh, they also did a swabbing and a, and a survey of the cleaning equipment. And the highest percentage was on cleaning equipment. 
Now, people are usually very surprised by that. I am not. Because what we do uh, when we train our staff and train our customers on cleaning and sanitation, we emphasize to them the importance of not only cleaning the equipment that processes the food, but you also have to clean the cleaning tools. The foamer hoses, the rinse hoses, the brushes, the squeegees, whatever. All that has to be cleaned and sanitized as well. If it's not, it then becomes a, uh, a source of cross-contamination because then you have workers touching a contaminated tool and then they become a transit area a, 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 to be able to become a vector for transmitting the bacteria or possible pathogens onto the previously cleaned equipment. So all of that is something that is, uh, it's becoming a, a more and more of a, of, a, of a difficult thing to emphasize because at the end of the night, when your staff are tired, they don't want to clean the tools but it's vitally important that they do. So that's just why that number is quite high there. But drains are always quite high as well in, in the presence of biofilms. Um, some of the, uh, on a, on a uh, biofilms in the process, in the, for the food production, some of the other hotspots, and this is an example that I took a picture of uh, many years ago where we had an issue, uh, things like the, uh, screw holes in properly uh, you know, ill-designed equipment, uh, rims on equipment that have been folded over, but there isn't a sanitary weld along the whole edge. So it provides a sort of a harborage for food to, to, to accumulate, protein to accumulate, which would then of course with water in the surface, you have the uh, issue of biofilm presence. Scratches, corners, ill-designed corners, junctions on equipment, uh, and, uh, and of course, hard to reach areas. All of those factors, uh, contribute to biofilm uh, establishment. And I, on this hard to reach area, you notice that it's pointing to this conveyor here. Now conveyors, from a standpoint of sanitation in my world, and I'm sure in your world as well, are the bane of my existence because they're poorly designed. They're designed to move food efficiently in a production environment with little thought as to how to clean them properly. This particular conveyor is actually not that great because these are solid stainless steel sides along this conveyor, which cannot be removed. So you can imagine what's behind this over years and years of work, what's behind this stainless steel wall where this conveyor is traveling. It can be, it can get quite, quite gross in there. So design points like that can, can be, present some really interesting challenges on your cleaning and sanitation with regards to dealing with biofilms. The other problem with biofilms is that they're very, uh, they're very aggressive and uh, corrosive. So they can deteriorate equipment, they can uh, corrode metallic surfaces, uh, stainless steel and aluminum. Uh, they can they have a really harsh, they're really harsh on concrete structures. So any concrete structures that hasn't been uh, sealed with, a, with a, a polymer or any online drains, they can, they can really degrade concrete structures significantly. So there's also a damage uh, factor involved here with the presence of biofilms as well. And again, as I said before, biofilms can establish on any surface. Uh, this is a brush with a biofilm growing on it. Someone who looks at that brush and, and can't, doesn't see that needs some more training or awareness. And this is a hose. There's a couple of things wrong with this hose. Number one, it's never been cleaned. It's not a very clear picture, but it's a very dirty hose. And as the hose is hung up, it's touching the floor. So a hose of any kind, whether it's a chemical application hose or a rinsing hose in your food production environment, when it's stored, it should never touch the floor. So again, there are many, many places that where biofilms can establish themselves. And a lot of these places present issues with regards to transference because of mechanical action of the equipment or transference from the standpoint of an individual grabbing that surface and then going and touching something else. So how do we identify a biofilm in your facility? Well, in the past, it's been quite difficult to do so. Because biofilms have certain characteristics. They can, biofilms in food plants are visible or invisible. And if they're invisible, they can still have a very negative effect on your production. They're very hard to remove as stated before because of that polysaccharide matrix that forms around the column. They're very resistant to conventional sanitation methods. 
and they're persistent under harsh conditions. So excessive heat, excessive uh, UV, excessive exposure to chemistry, they are very, very resistant to all of those things. So how do we identify, how do we identify biofilms in your processing facility? If you think you have a biofilm uh, infestation, uh, it usually presents itself with the uh, account of an unwanted uh, pathogenic or unwanted bacteria that has spiked inadvertently over out of nowhere and then sort of diminishes. And then a number of days later, it'll spike again and then diminish. That is uh, a, a sign of a biofilm releasing micro microorganisms contracting and then releasing them again over a period of time. So the way that we suggest to our, 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 our customers, our clients is to start by having QA and sanitation map out and inspect your production flow and facility. The reason why you wanna do this is for a number of reasons why you wanna do it. First, it will help re-familiarize yourself with your facility on a very uh, micro uh, uh, view. So you'll be able to follow your production through, get a more better understanding of where the, the, the possible shortcomings are in your structure, in your equipment, in your flow. Uh, it'll help uh, determine weak points in that flow of equipment and structure. And, uh, the, and, and also it'll help you identify any possible in employee behavior impacts, people not transitioning properly, people not washing their hands properly, maybe design uh, 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 shortcomings within the actual transition area. All of those things is where you would start. You would start by becoming more intimate with your production flow of the facility and your facility. And you have to get it down on paper. So it usually is on paper in the form for, there's many ways, there's many places where it can be recorded. You all probably already have uh, as part of your uh, of QMPs uh, documentations that you can refer to. But the whole point of this process is to become more intimately aware of, the, of your production facility because that's, that's where it starts. And it's really important. And I strongly suggest that when you do this, it's a collaboration between QA and the sanitation crew. Uh, because the, at this point, both would, would have a vested interest in addressing this issue. Uh, a really good tool for doing, uh, for detecting biofilms is a product that we manufactured and developed called BioDetect. So what this is, this is a product that is a ready to use product. It's in a spray bottle form. Uh, and what it does, if you apply it to a suspected area where you suspect the biofilm may be, uh, it will immediately react with that polysaccharide matrix of biofilm. It will not react with a protein. So you can spray this on a piece of protein that you're developing, whether it's produce or red meat or whatever, it won't react with that. But if there's a biofilm present, it will react. And the way it reacts, it reacts by either turning red or it reacts by turning uh, uh, white, like, like an like a, a effervescent sort of white fuzzy uh, reaction. And then you can identify and have a visual and immediate identification of, of the presence of biofilm. Uh, this is a video that shows it. We're gonna spray it on this little test paper here, this test plate, and automatically you'll see that the biofilm will show itself. And they're very smart bacteria because they can smell, they can spell, biodetect as they lay there. But this is how it would present itself if there was a biofilm present on your in on your equipment. It would show up immediately like that. So it's a very it's a very good product to use as part of your detection and evaluation process. Uh, another area you see it there is showing up on this area here. This area is is uh, this little piece of of equipment you know offers a lot of harborage with cracks and and sort of layers where. Uh, food can congregate and accumulate. And of course, bacteria can establish itself and create a biofilm is exactly what happened here. Uh, here's a conveyor, another place common where biofilms establish themselves. So you have tools to, to identify where they are. So effective strategies uh, to control biofilms on your sanitation program. Use your newfound knowledge from your, from your, from your audit, from your, from your investigations from your mapping and auditing information to systematically search for the biofilms. And once you do that, follow the flow of production and traffic flow of staff 
from start to finish. So what I am suggesting here as part of this process, this is not like we'll, we'll do this in the morning. This is a multi-day uh, 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 investment of time to find out exactly, you know, try to find out where the issues are. So it takes some time, you're auditing many things, you're auditing, you're auditing and, and uh, measuring structure, equipment, flow, staff behavior, a number of things to get a full picture. And the Sandy Mark Biotech is an excellent tool for this process to identify along the way where the problem areas may be. The other thing uh, that you need is training. Now, your sanitation chemical supplier, whoever they may be, uh, should be able to provide you with this resource. Uh, this is not an easy thing to address. It can be addressed and it can be addressed very effectively and a, and a, and a good ongoing uh, biofilm control program is something that can be easily adapted and added to your already existing uh, sanitation program but it's something that has to be done and addressed correctly. So your sanitation supplier should have the resources to provide you with the training and, and the direction of how you should approach it. Uh, the solution to addressing a biofilm in your facility is more than just adding another chemical. Uh, I would never go into an, a, a situation where there's an issue with biofilms and not offer the training and support to go along with the chemistry required because it's not simply a matter of applying another chemistry. There's more to it than that. Uh, it consists of support, auditing, training, using the science to constantly improve your process. That's what it's about. So the other thing that I would suggest and, and do suggest to, to my clients is to consider establishing a 5S management program. Now the 5S management program is a, is a structured management program that will allow you to incorporate your staff uh, as part of this process. And what it does, it stands for sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. It was, uh, it's a way of, of getting, getting your staff involved and as part of the solution. And it gives them ownership of being a solution to that problem. And if it's implemented correctly, uh, it's something that can have a very powerful result in a positive manner uh, for, your, for your facility. Um, sanitation staff are part of the, the solving this particular issue. But unfortunately, because of the nature of what they do and when they do it at night, sanitation staff are usually the most, one of the most underappreciated groups of people in the whole food production area, in the whole food production uh, world. And yet they are a crucial aspect to food safety. So uh, incorporating their expertise and their knowledge and their experience as part of the solution is a very powerful thing to do. Um, the, S, the 5S program uh, was, was beginning with, with the Toyota production um, system. And it, um, it was a, a way of, of getting feedback and, in, and including the staff in the various production plants to uh, uh, incorporate uh, Reduce costs, higher quality, increased productivity, greater employee satisfaction, and a safer work environment. And that 5S approach has been has been copied and um, throughout the world by by huge huge multinational companies as a way to become uh, all of these things. So this is something that I would I would ask you to to consider as part of that program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the chemistries and tools required for biofilm removal. So now we have gone through a process of, of gaining knowledge, of better understanding, of finding where the issues are, of incorporation of our staff, of really getting to a point where now we know what we have to do, how do we do it? Then we talk to the chemistry. This is actually a good news story because it, it's not that complicated. Uh, what you need for tools is you need a portable foamer. So this is just an example of a portable foamer. You put the uh, diluted solution of the product that you require, the chemistry, in this unit. This unit is powered by a compressed air line. So you plug a compressed air line onto it, which powers a pump, which then is a plot. You apply the, the product with, a, with a, a foamer. So this is not a pressurized vessel. This, the, the solution is pumped out of here 
injected with air and it is, is foamed on your equipment. The other thing you need is a drain foam attachment. So there are various types of drain foam attachments to, that enable you to foam the product throughout the drain uh, as part of a biofilm sanitation program, uh, a biofilm elimination, a biofilm control program. So a, a drain foam attachment is one pick, pick, uh, tool required. Uh, a mixing dispensing equipment for mixing and dispensing and filling the foam unit, very low tech, very low cost, uh, uh, mixing dispensing equipment required to do that. So it's all hands off and designated biofilm cleaning tools. Now I have a picture here of a, a floor squeegee, uh, a black bucket and a black hand scrubbing thing. There's other tools of all, uh, as well. The reason why I've posted these three pictures is because for biofilm, uh, addressing biofilm cleaning and removal, and anything to do with the floor, your tools, we always suggest to our customers that our tools should be color-coded black. So a black tool only has contact with the floor and the drain. And then as you proceed, you had to be careful. Scrubbing will simply spread the bacteria all around the facility, so you have to know how to address it properly so you're not spreading the bacteria from the biofilm you're trying to remove. Uh, products that only disrupt the exopolymer matrix of a biofilm will spread bacteria and allow the dormant bacteria in the biofilm to come back. So things like normal cleaning uh, chemistry, like you know your chlorinated alkaline or acid chemistry, will actually only spread the biofilm. Um, products that only kill bacteria will not penetrate very deeply into that into that biofilm matrix. And a biofilm structure, even a dead one, that stays on the surface. Is now, is now an established starting point for a new biofilm to reestablish itself. So we got to get rid of that, of that polysaccharide matrix and the bacteria colony within that. And the way we do it is with our product called BioDestroy. Now BioDestroy is a very inexpensive and a very, it's an inexpensive and a very effective product to use and a very easy product to use. Uh, the contact time is five minutes for a quick turnaround. It's easy to apply, it's just one product. A lot of products out there, there are some products out there that require to mix two products together and then let it activate and then take that and dilute that activated product. And then what you don't use, you throw it away. This is just one product that gets diluted. Uh, the foam application that we formulated this product with allows, allow, uh, allows contact time. And the reason why we formulated this product as a foaming product as opposed to a gelling product. Most of our cleaning technology is in the form of a gel. Uh, we use, we formulated this product as a foaming agent because the main use for this product is in drains. So when you foam it into a drain, the foam actually uh, makes contact with all the surface area of the drain. You, it actually fills the entire drain with foam. So all the surface area within the drain is in contact with this product and the entire surface is, is, is uh, impacted by the, by the presence of the, of the, of the BioDestroy product. Uh, it's a very thick, dense foam, has the consistency of shaving cream. Uh, this product is used at either a 1% or 2% dilution. Uh, the results after one, oh, sorry. Uh, previous, sorry. Uh, the results after one application, there's results. Uh, it's low cost, uh, a four liter a mixture of this product at a 1% solution is 66 cents. And that will create lots and lots of foam, that four liter. So it's an it's a inexpensive cost of use. It's phosphate free, so the formula offers a very positive environmental profile. Actually, it breaks down into primarily vinegar, CO2, and water in the environment. Uh, now, when you're using a biofilm, when you're using BioDestroy, this is what happens. If you use the product and apply the product, your bacteria counts will spike for a day. You use it, you'll get a spike for a day or a day and a half, and then you swab again and it drops down to nothing. That spike is showing that the product is working. That's where you're actually breaking up and destroying the biofilm, and then it will drop to nothing. So that's when we know that we've actually are using the BioDestroy and it's actually addressing a biofilm issue. So in addition to using BioDestroy initially, we use it in conjunction with swabbing to substantiate 
use of it that, that is being used properly. This is just a, uh, a, a, a graph that was done for us in health testing uh, for the efficacy of the, of the product. So here is the actual concentration of the product and here is the uh, reduction of the, uh, of the count. So at a 1.2 to 1.6 concentration of, this, of the BioDestroy, we're getting a, a 5.5 to a, a 6.5 log reduction in, in uh, bacteria. And same here, this was a study done for us by Montana State University. And again, we have concentration up to 1.35 to 1.35 really. And the, uh, the log reduction is like seven. So it's a very effective product in use for, for reducing or removing biofilms and destroying bacteria. And again, another slide there that shows that in five minutes at 1% at 1 in hard water, a 6.04 to 5.45 log reduction on Pseudomonius on 6.4, Streptococcus 5.45. <clears throat> so let's take a close look. Here is a uh, surface with a biofilm at times 100, times 200, and times 1,000. And after treatment, uh, we get down to uh, a 1.6 log, 200 times, 1,000 times electron microscope. It's practically, you know, you can see the surface now. There's very little growth left behind. So, support mecha mechanisms that are available to you as a consumer, uh, as, a, as a producer. Uh, there's myself. Uh, I work for Sanimark. Uh, I'm a very uh, available. Uh, if you have any questions, this is my email address, my cell phone number. Uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions, call me. Uh, whether you're a client of mine or not, you can call me and I'll certainly be able to, to uh, at the very least, point you in the right direction if you require that. Uh, Perennia uh, has an email. If you go to safefoods at perennia.ca, uh, that will immediately go to the food safety and regulatory specialist. So if you have any inquiries on uh, biofilms or suspected biofilm issues within your facility, that's a resource for you here in Nova Scotia. Your sanitation supplier should be a resource for you here. Um, your sanitation supplier needs to be a partner on, on all aspects of your sanitation program. And uh, um, that's something that you should expect as a consumer, but your sanitation supplier should be that resource for you. And actually the company that makes the Viking, um, the Viking Remco line of, of cleaning tools, they're a great source of information. They have a number of webinars. They recently had a webinar on biofilms and drains. And a lot of that information was actually quite good. I used it as a resource for this presentation. So that's one resource available for you as well if you want to uh, look into that. So to conclude, what we're talking about today is just another aspect of food safety. Processing a safe product for the marketplace. Establishing an effective, repeatable cleaning and sanitation process through knowledge and ongoing improvement. That's what needs to happen in a sanitation program in any food production environment, big or small. Biofilm control should be a part of that program. Uh, it's becoming, uh, and it can be effectively adapted so that you are still establishing an efficient and repeatable sanitation program. Uh, I just want to conclude with one, also with one little uh, piece of information that I came across in, in doing research for this uh, presentation. Uh, I, I try to keep abreast of, of uh, the ongoing changes in the, in the industry, and it's, it's a challenge to do so. But there's one particular program I listen to quite frequently. It's on the BBC News World Service. It's called The Food Chain. And they had an interesting episode on September the 8th of this year uh, called Inside Food Safety Scares. And uh, they, in, they interviewed an engineer, Lone uh, Jefferson, uh, who's presently of the Cultivate, Cultivate Food Safety, but uh, she was the, uh, the lead person uh, to address the, uh, the recall at Maple Leaf during the Listeria issue back in 2008. And she had some very interesting insights to the, um, to the food industry today. And, uh, and how the food industry has evolved from that and learned from that experience and how they haven't yet learned from that experience. But what she said, and I paraphrase here, she said, the measures of success for a food production business should include food safety, 
food safety has to be a regularly discussed topic in the boardroom, on the boardroom agenda. So just as you would discuss profit and loss, et cetera, et cetera, part of that discussion ongoing has to be food safety as a measurement of success. When it starts to happen in the boardroom, it starts to happen on the line. Um, so interesting comment, uh, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, my reference for the presentation was the uh, Viking uh, uh, website. This is the link to the biofilms, Know Your Enemy and Defeat Them in the Drains. Uh, Deb Smith, the global hygiene specialist was uh, very informative on that presentation. And of course the reference that is, that is made to with the BBC News World Service and the various references I made throughout the slides on the presentation. So that was a very concise and a very uh, condensed uh, uh, education on, on biofilms in the industrial food sector. Uh, I've probably given you enough information to, to almost make you dangerous, but uh, it, it, information is good, knowledge is power. So that's a good place to start. So I open up the, I open up the, um, the, uh, to the group for any questions that you may have and I'll do my best to answer them. We do have a couple of questions. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, when seeking and eliminating the biofilm, can it be eliminated uh, environmentally in the processing plant uh, once you have it? The answer is yes, it can be eliminated. Uh, and the other question that you should ask is, will it come back? And the answer is yes, it will. Uh, here's why. If you have a biofilm that's present and presenting itself as an issue, it's presenting itself as an issue because an environment exists for it to exist. There are environmental uh, processes there that allow it to actually establish and continue to grow. So once you establish the biofilm, it can be removed and it can be controlled through the, through the ongoing use of the biodestroy as part of your sanitation program. But when you do the auditing of your plant with regards to the flow that we discussed earlier, you're identifying areas that are problem areas that allow that biofilm to establish itself. Those need to be corrected at some point in time, whether it cracks in the floor or design the equipment a little better or your flow differently, that has to be changed as well. So there's, it's more to it than just, yeah, I have a biofilm, let's use BioDestroy, now it's gone away. We still have to change the behaviors or change the structure so that we can control the biofilm with those factors as well. In the dry cleaning world, yeah. is there biofilms that would build up in that kind of an environment? Uh, I have encountered it a couple of times. Uh, but mostly it's when you have, uh, where a biofilm is present in a dry cleaning world, uh, it's usually associated with bakeries and it's usually around the proofer. Okay. The industrial proofer. So for those of anyone online here who doesn't know what that is, it's essentially a big cabinet that provides heat and moisture as part of proofing the dough before, yeah. before it goes into the, into the uh, oven. And then, you know, around that area where you have, you know, flour everywhere, there's yeast, and then now there's moisture and heat, that's where it usually establishes itself in a dry cleaning environment. 